Endurance brings to mind the difficult training athletes endure to be at the top of their game. The pain ballerinas endure as their feet crack and bleed from hours on point. The steep trail that backpackers endure over a mountain pass. Endurance is also seen in the stamina required for musicians and actors to perform well for long periods of time. The body has to learn how to endure in order to get stronger. The Bible doesn't say that because we are Christians, we get to skip the hard stuff. And as God's people, we aren't promised a life without hardship. What God does promise us though, is that we aren't alone in our sufferings. God is with us, our help in times of trouble. We don't often boast about suffering, but from Romans 5, we will learn that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And this hope does not disappoint us. We all just need a little biblical endurance training. Have you ever experienced the smell of fresh bread baking? As the aroma and warmth of the bread leaves the oven and fills every nook and cranny of the house. When I was growing up, my mom and dad would bring me and my brothers to my grandparents' house every Sunday after church for Wallace family dinner. All my cousins and aunts and uncles would be there and we would share a meal. And a staple of Wallace family dinner was freshly baked bread. My dad had been taught how to make bread by his grandma, my great grandma Wallace. And he carried that tradition forward and so Wallace family dinner was often marked by the smell of this freshly baked bread in the oven. But my dad's Wallace bread wasn't the only bread at Wallace family dinner. The other was a plastic loaf of bread that sat on the shelf above the table. And this says our daily bread on the side. And inside of it are a bunch of different colored cards, each with a different Bible verse written on it. My grandma would ask one of us to bring this bread to her. And as we sat on the table, around the table, before we ate, before we broke the Wallace bread, she would take one of the cards out and read the verse. And then we would pray. And then we could eat. And this taught me a really important lesson growing up, that in life, there are two types of bread. One type of bread, like Wallace bread, would excite our senses and fill our tummies. But the other type of bread, that would excite our spirits and fill our souls. One was food for the body. The other is food for the soul. There are two types of bread. We, the people of God, we're a strange people. We live both here in the physical world and as members of a heavenly kingdom that is elsewhere. We live on earth, and yet we proclaim the truth of the kingdom of heaven, the eternal kingdom that will never end. We are a people of two worlds, a people of anticipation, both thankful for the physical world around us that God gave us and looking forward to the future that God promises us, the new heaven and the new earth when all things will be redeemed. We are a people who not only feed our physical bodies, we take time out to feed our souls, to nourish a different part of us. We are a people of the physical world and of the spiritual, a people of the now and not yet, a people who proclaim the truth that there are two kinds of bread. We're coming to the end of our in series called Endurance, where we look to God to build endurance in us through the difficult things in life so that we might not just survive them, but so that we can have hope and character in the midst of them. So far, in this series, we've learned about enduring through change, enduring through relationships, through faith crisis, through loneliness and prejudice and disappointment. I hope the series has been an encouragement to you. It's been one for me. The series takes uh, inspiration from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 
Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also boast in our sufferings, because we know suffering produces perseverance or endurance. Endurance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So next week, Pastor Fraser will land this plane on our endurance series, bringing it to a close. But this week, I want to talk about endurance through another hardship of life. Endurance through illness. And this topic hits close to home for me, as I'm sure it does for many of you. As I have dealt with my own issues of chronic illness throughout my life, as I've walked with friends who have had their lives turned upside down by these unexpected illnesses, and perhaps most potently by watching my dad battle cancer for half of my life, I've seen up close and personal this weight, this heaviness that comes from carrying the burden of illness in life. I have a friend of mine, someone I respect immensely, who's told me that each sermon should answer a how or a why or a what. Endurance through illness, that's a how question. How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? The Apostle Paul gives us a lot to chew on in regards to that question in several letters to the New Testament churches that he writes. But there's one in particular that I think speaks to us this morning. It's a little bit of a long passage, but hear this word, this living bread. <laughs> Hear this, this today. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, and then skipping ahead to chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we, are, we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we have. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. And skipping ahead to chapter 4. Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but, what on, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you knowing that you have gone before us and behind us and beside us and within us. We ask that today you meet us here in this, this question. How do we endure through illness? Meet us and bring us hope and produce in us character and hope and endurance. We pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. 
How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? The Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, he suffered immensely. Throughout the New Testament, we read about how he suffered persecution at the hands of religious leaders who thought he was teaching blasphemy and at the hands of the Roman government. We see that he suffered imprisonment and hunger and thirst and broken relationships and loneliness. But also in 2 Corinthians, in this book, he also talks about a, a thorn in his flesh, something that we're not quite sure what it is, but he says he asks God to take it away from him three times, but God doesn't. We don't quite know what this is, but he says it makes him suffer. Some scholars have guessed that this might be some sort of chronic illness that plagued Paul. Maybe something to do with his, his sight as he lost his vision when he met Christ. We don't know what Paul suffered as this thorn in his side, but we see that as kind of an invitation. Because we don't know what it is that he suffered, we all can kind of bring our own sufferings and hear his words for us, no matter what it is we face. So although we don't know if the sufferings Paul is speaking about here are the sufferings of illness or loss or another kind, I think it has a lot to speak to us today with our topic of enduring through illness. How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? Paul gives us this profound truth that in life, there are two types of bread two types of bread. Did you catch that? Therefore, we don't lose heart. Outwardly, we are wasting away, but inwardly, we're renewed day by day. There's light and momentary troubles, and then there's eternal glory. We fix our eyes on what is seen, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, because there's this temporary and there's this eternal. See, Paul says there are two types of bread. There's what we can see and what we can't see. There's what is temporary, there's what is eternal. There's this outward part of us that is wasting away. But inwardly, as the people of God, we can be renewed day by day. There are two types of bread. And this is where Paul starts. I think this is what helps us to endure in suffering, recognizing this difference between the part of us that is temporary and the part of us that endures. Now I have to say right here near the beginning of this sermon that I believe we are embodied beings. I believe it is not the full picture to just separate us as spiritual and physical beings, but that that is connected and intertwined and relate to each other. I believe this so thoroughly that for a long time I really scoffed at this teaching of Paul that appears throughout the New Testament because I thought, it's too simplistic. But since walking with people and walking my own journey of illness, I have seen the power of this message. So although I believe we are embodied beings and that there's, there's more to the story, I have seen the power of this in telling someone who is suffering from illness that there's a whole part of them that the illness cannot touch. That although our bodies may be wasting away, our souls aren't, not as children of God. And so I think I was really wrong to dismiss this kind of teaching because throughout centuries, Christians have relied on this truth and Paul evidently really thinks it's true. Throughout his letters, he reminds us of this difference between the spiritual life and the life of the flesh, between what is temporary and what we can see and what is eternal and what we can't see. And this reminds us of that fundamental truth that there's more to life than what we see or feel or touch or smell or taste. There's something else. There's something other. And Paul uses this to look his suffering in the face and mount a holy protest. You are not all there is to me. There's something else. And that that is being renewed. That, that belongs to God. Because this kind of bread, this is temporary. 
This has a shelf life. This will grow old and stale and moldy. But this kind of bread, it doesn't have a shelf life. This kind of bread, this keeps nourishing day by day. This kind of bread is what we can rely on in our lives. The kind of bread that has the power to renew us from the inside out. There are two types of bread. This teaching isn't just found in the letters of the Apostle Paul, but it is also seen perhaps most potently in the image of Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross, his body broken, bleeding, in pain. Jesus on the cross where his body is outwardly wasting away. This image that seems so much like defeat and brokenness. And yet that's not the whole story, is it? That's not the whole story of the cross. No, because Jesus is fighting an inward battle on that cross that accomplishes something greater than just the physical. Outwardly, it seems as if he is broken and has failed, and we cannot know what would happen except to look ahead and see the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. Because as it looks as if Jesus is wasting away during those times from the crucifixion on Friday through his body in the tomb Saturday to the empty tomb Sunday, he is being renewed day by day as he defeats sin and death and brings to all of creation new life. See, the cross is this perfect example. Outwardly, you can look as if you're wasting away when inwardly, there is not defeat. There's victory. There's renewal. There is new life. And this just keeps bringing us back to this fundamental truth of the Christian life that there's more to life than what we see. There's more to life than just physical bread. There are two types of bread. And each day, I think as I struggle with an illness, I'm reminded that although I'm wasting away, I look at Jesus. Jesus knows what it's like to waste away. Jesus knows, and he gives us this picture of what it looks like for us to be renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. All that is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? Lean on this truth that there's not one, but two types of bread. But the good news doesn't stop there. Paul gives us another message about this idea of enduring through illness in 2 Corinthians, because Paul says in chapter one, verse eight, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that, man, I thought I could take this on, but I am beyond myself now. I don't have what it takes to keep doing this. I think that idea of endurance in the face of illness, that is difficult. And more than maybe a lot of other things in life, illness is something that really brings you to that point. Chronic illness, difficult illness, that, that weighs on you. And I know I have seen loved ones be at that place where they could not endure on their own. But what is the answer? What does Paul say? This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises from the dead. Paul says part of this truth that remembering that there's two types of bread, that there's the temporary and the eternal, that there's the physical and the spiritual, part of that truth of remembering this is that when you're coming to the end of your rope, what do you rely on? Do you rely on the things of this world to keep you going? Or do you rely on what is unseen? Do you rely on the kind of spiritual food that can build you up Paul is saying, rely on God. 
Because of course you're gonna come to the end of your rope where you cannot endure on your own. We are meant to do this life with God. We are meant to draw on the means of grace, the spiritual disciplines of prayer and searching the scriptures and fasting and, and time alone in front of God, meditation. These things bring us close to God. They're the grace that gives us that, that presence of God in our lives. We are meant to rely on those. This is how we endure when we think that we cannot endure any longer. To be a person who's found the truth of the power of continually coming before God, of continually seeking God's presence, that is one of the ways Paul says he, in his struggles, endured. The longest recorded conversation that Jesus has with any individual person in all of the Gospels is his conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And Jesus breaks through the barriers of culture, gender, religion, custom, to speak to this Samaritan woman alone. And she, she comes to the well because she's thirsty. She has to get water, physical water, to quench her thirst, to help her live, to help her cook and clean and do these essential things in life. And she comes to this well and Jesus is there, a Jewish rabbi alone speaking to a woman a Samaritan woman, and she points out to him how strange this is when he asks her for a drink of water. She points out to him, how, how are you, a Jewish man, asking me for a drink of water? And Jesus tells her that if she only knew who was asking, she would ask him for a drink of living water so that she would never thirst again. He says, everyone who drinks of this water that I have to give will never be thirsty again, and it will become in them the spring water welling up into eternal life. You see, she comes to the well for physical water, something to sustain her physically. And Jesus reminds her that you cannot live on that alone, that there is something else, a living water, relying on Jesus to give you something that will quench your thirst forever, that will quench a thirst deeper than just the physical. Jesus reminds her that you must lean on God, not on the things of this world. That there is water, I love that, living water, as opposed to physical water. Just like this eternal bread, as opposed to the physical bread. How do you endure when you are someone you love suffers from illness? Paul says here, first, recognize the truth that there are two types of bread. And second, lean on what is eternal. Lean on God to get you by. Feed yourself with the eternal bread. And lastly, I think Paul gives us one other piece of advice in this part of scripture. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may comfort others in theirs from the comfort we receive from God. See, Paul is not suffering alone. And he's not suffering for no reason. Paul is suffering and, and saying that he's going to lean on God in his suffering so that he can then bring comfort to others. So that this well of living water that is springing up within him will pour out of him to those around him. This is so powerful to me. It reminds me of what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, the father of our tradition here at CCF. It reminds me of what he taught about the means of grace, the ways we experience God. Because in addition to the ones I spoke before, of prayer and fasting and searching the scriptures, there are a whole other section of the means of grace that John Wesley calls um, the acts of mercy. Because he recognizes what Paul is saying here, that there is something to be gained from helping others. But that language doesn't make sense in our world. Because we know that if we help others, that helps them. 
But what Paul is saying, what John Wesley says, is when we help others, we also experience God in our lives. That hand we are extending is the hand of God, not only for them, but for us. This is one of those mysteries, one of those things that we can't quite explain, but we know it to be true. Because there's a something special, not only when you help others, but when you are suffering yourself and extending that hand. There's something beautiful in that. Because when you are all healthy and you're giving to other people, you're giving out of what you have a lot of. I got a lot of energy, I got a lot of talent, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give from that. But when you're giving, when you're giving from when you have almost nothing left, from under this burden of illness and suffering, that's holy ground. That's like the widow who would give her two copper coins to the temple offering. And Jesus says she's giving far more than any of the wealth that anyone else is giving because they're giving out of their excess, but she's giving all she has. There's something beautiful to that. I saw this truth. Um, the power of someone who is ill helping others. I saw that in my dad. And even until his last days, he was mentoring countless people over the phone from his chair. And when he could no longer sit in his chair from his bed, some would even come to the house and sit out on his patio and the door would be open where they could hear his voice from the bed. My dad, who was wasting away day by day on the outside, knew the truth that he was being renewed inside by God. That each day that passed, his body seemed to be wasting away more and more, but his soul, the inside, the part that's eternal, that was, that was being renewed. That was stronger each day that went on. And he gave out of that well of living water to those around him. He would always say, as he made this Grandma Wallace bread throughout my life, the making of the bread isn't the fun part. It's the giving it away. See, there's something to recognizing that there's two kinds of bread. Leaning into the one that is eternal, leaning on God to get you by, to sustain you, to renew you, and then giving it away, helping others. There's something miraculous there, something holy. And it was amazing to witness. How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? Recognize two types of bread. Lean on God and then give away what you have. You know, this next thought doesn't fit well in this sermon. <laughs> but I have to say, um, any sermon on illness should say something like this. In the American church, we don't have a good theology of suffering. We don't. When I was in high school, I came back to school the day after my grandfather had died, my dad's dad, who also died of cancer. And as I sat in my Bible class, my Bible teacher felt the need to tell the class why my grandpa had died. And he said, there was some sort of sin in Kate's grandpa's life. That's why he had cancer. That's why he died. God was punishing him. That's bad theology. I knew it then and I know it now. That's simple answers for a simple faith that wants God to be small enough to fit into a very understandable and nice clean box. But that's not the God that we see in the Bible. And this might seem like a shocking story, but I know so many people who think some part of this to be true. I've had friends whisper to me this sin that they've been carrying around for their whole life and unable to tell anyone, and then ask me, is that why I'm sick? Is God punishing me for that sin that I did way back then? Jesus asked a similar question when he and his disciples walked by a man who was born blind. You may be familiar with the story. They ask, why is this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? 
And Jesus says, no, it has nothing to do with that. This man didn't sin, nor his parents, but God's glory can come even from this. The sun rises on the evil and the good. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. We see this in the book of Job when we read about a righteous man who suffers the loss of his family and his home and his wealth and then gets ill. And his friends come around him and try to convince him that it's because he is not righteous, because he is actually sinful and he needs to repent, because God's punishing him. But the truth of the book of Job tells us he's righteous. That's not how God works. If you have ever wondered if your illness or the illness of someone you love is the punishment of God, I have to say, that's not how God works. God doesn't look out and punish every sin with some sort of illness. That's just not the story that the Bible tells. And the book of Romans, where we are taking our inspiration for this endurance series, I think it, Romans 8, that says there is now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. If you believe in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, if you believe Jesus has taken all your sin and made you righteous, then there's nothing for God to even condemn, even if God did work that way. Because when God sees you, God sees you through the blood of the lamb, cleansed, righteous. There's no condemnation for you if you are a child of God, if you're washed in the blood. By Jesus' wounds, we are healed. And there's a lot we don't know in this world. But what we can learn from the Bible is that God created this world to be good. But something happened. And, and this world is now filled with decay. It's not as it should be. And our lives are now marked by that same decay too. But God is redeeming all things. And in the end, all things will be made new. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. There are two types of bread. Last March, my grandma Ginger, in whose house we had Wallace family dinner growing up, she contracted COVID. And very quickly she was sent away to the hospital to get treatment and where she was isolated and alone. And while she was in that hospital room, she sent word through a nurse that she wanted two things, her cell phone and her Bible. She wanted her phone so that she could hear the voices of those she loved. She wanted her Bible so she could read the words of the Heavenly Father. In those first few months of COVID, hospitals were more strict even than they are now. And they didn't let anything in or out. So my grandma's request went unmet until she got worse and was transferred to a different hospital. And at that new hospital, she said, once again, I would like my phone and my Bible. And little did she know that a nurse at that hospital had attended her church. And she knew my aunts and uncles, and she arranged to get my grandma her phone and her Bible. And we thought that was a miracle that in my grandma's final days, she was able to hear the voices of her children and to be entrenched in the words of her heavenly father. But little did we know that that nurse who knew us, who knew my grandma, had been praying for ways that she and her church could bless the hospital. And through my grandma's one small act of faithfulness, of asking for her Bible, this nurse heard the voice of God. When Ginger asked for a Bible, she told us later, we realized we had none on the floor to give her. So she worked with her church and 
with the hospital administration to provide Bibles to each of the 13 units in the hospital so that every room would have the Word of God in it. Outwardly, my grandma was wasting away, but she knew there were two times of bread. She knew to lean on the one that was eternal. And when she asked for it in a simple act of faith, it was given to others. It was multiplied, and the love of God spread to each room of that hospital like the aroma and warmth of freshly baked bread, filling every nook and cranny of her house. How do you endure when you or someone you love suffers from illness? Remember, there are two types of bread. Lean on God. Lean on what is eternal. Invest there. And when you do that, give what you learn and what you have to others. The truth is, this is a message for all of us, isn't it? We're talking about enduring through illness, but outwardly, we are all wasting away. Just those who have the burden of illness know this truth better than we do. How might you be wasting away? And how might you lean into what is eternal instead? How might you make a deposit into the things that matter so that even though outwardly you are wasting away, you can be renewed through God day by day. We are the people of God. May we be a people not just of the physical world, but of the spiritual world as well. May we be a people not of what is seen, but what is unseen. May we be a people not just of the now, but also of the not yet. May we be a people who proclaim the truth there's not one, but two types of bread. Amen? Amen. Almighty.
Thank you for worshiping with us here at CCF. I hope you were encouraged by the message of biblical endurance and the reminder that you are not alone in your suffering. God is close to the brokenhearted. Remember, no matter what you are facing, you do not have to endure it alone. There is a loving community here at CCF and I hope you will choose to connect with us this week. If you explore our website or download our app, you will find information on connecting with an online life group, sharing your story or prayer requests with our team. And of course, I would love for you to join us in person for our outdoor Sunday services. And also, how to learn more about Jesus and take a new step in your faith journey. So please do not hesitate to contact us if you have questions or if you're considering your next steps in faith, we would love to come alongside you. The Bible tells us that because of God's great love for us, we can boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. I pray you feel the presence of God in the hardships of life, that God would be your guide in difficult seasons, and that you might experience the hope of biblical endurance. Amen, amen. Go in peace, beloved, and I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.